As a touring band, we've always been aware of the damage our industry and its behavior does to the environment. Through the years, we've taken steps to mitigate our carbon footprint, but these steps have always been unilateral. Once the UN IPCC 1.5 report called for rapid, far-reaching and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society, we knew we had to go a lot further. We contacted the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change last year and planned to work with them on solutions for decarbonisation. Like everyone else, we had no idea that our plans would suddenly be put on pause. And with the live events sector now devastated and receiving so little support from government, the challenges become more complex. We've been working with Massive Attack to look at their own emissions from their own tours and what they can do to, to address that, to change that. Um, and so whilst we as the kind of um, you know, bean counting academics are working out the emissions from their tours, they've actually gone off and just started getting into, let's start trialing this and looking at new ways of doing things. So it gives us a real kind of live environment to get the findings from our work into. Um, so mainly our work is about looking at their tours and then working with them and other people across the music sector to say, how could we do things differently? How could we reassemble the way that we do live music? As well as the havoc the pandemic wreaks across our lives, there's also opportunity within that enforced hiatus to reflect and to change. We came to the realization that our industry couldn't or wouldn't move fast enough for live music to play its part in rapid decarbonization. So we opted to design that change ourselves to put together the identities and the circumstances to push for it and show that it's possible. Well, we have to decarbonize everything. Um, every aspect of life, you know, the whole country's got to get to zero carbon. Our government has said we need to do it by 2050. That's, of course, uh, unambitious. We need to do it sooner than that. Um, but there, there are no exceptions. We have to do it everywhere. And, uh, you know, big events uh, are just the same as everything else, really. When you're not waiting for an industry, the equation and the challenge itself changes. You take a holistic picture of the world and ask where are the most emissions coming from and how do we reduce them faster? And then you realise with the help of experts like the Tyndall Centre that the partner you need isn't a promoter, a festival or a venue, it's actually a city. Issues like transport infrastructure or power are bigger than one event and ideally if you're serious you want to try and leave a blueprint for future shows. I think the, the great thing about Liverpool is we always take risks on events and we're really up for taking risks and we're really up for kind of doing things that are new, that are different, that give an audience a really different experience of something and I think when the conversation started with Massive Attack, for us it's really important that we're at the front of everything as a city, we do events really, really well and for us the next stage is how we do them kind of better, not just well but how we do them where they're better for people, for the environment and for the next generation. Live music, live experiences are so important to so many people and they're so diverse, you know, um, and for me, they're part of what's like beautiful in life and the idea that you just say, well, you know, let's not do them because they're, because they can be high carbon um, doesn't feel like the best option for me. Let's look at how we could assemble them differently so that they could fit as part of a, a, a transition to, to net zero. And I think one of the things you've seen through the, the COVID period so far is how much people miss these kinds of experiences and the, the innovation that, that the sector is showing to try and still allow those to go forward in different ways and connect with people in different ways. It's really exciting. It shows how important this is to people, particularly through a time of crisis. But it also has some risks because some of the things that we're talking about doing in order to make gigs COVID secure would increase their carbon emissions if they were kind of locked in as practice going forward. So lots of things about, you know, like driving gigs and things like that. We need to really be careful that we don't reassemble after this period with things like that baked in. I think it's a really critical moment um, to make sure that as we as we rebuild the sector, as it comes out of this period of crisis, that, that we do that in a way that gives it long-term sustainability. Working with Liverpool and Ecotricity in particular, we have found partners who are prepared to take a risk with us and create a catalyst that shows extremely low carbon and ultimately carbon neutral events are not only possible, they're viable and conducive to the overall experience of live art or live music. 
You know, for me, energy, transport, and food are the big three areas of life that we've got to tackle. 80% of everybody's uh, carbon footprint and kind of impact on the world is, is in those three things, how we power ourselves, how we travel, and what we eat. And, you know, those uh, facets, they're prominent in a gig, they're prominent in a football game. Uh, you know, you, you can see that in a company of any size, and it applies to us as individuals as well. The things we spend our money on every day uh, are causing 80% of the impact and it's within our control. So um, I don't think a gig is, is any different to anything else in that respect. You know, these are the big three areas of life that we have to tackle and um, we have to tackle them in cities as well. I think it's got to be a model of, of if you could dream big, how you could get there. And I think for loads of our organisations who've really suffered over the last six months, loads of our smaller music organisations, our musicians, but also the supply chain, to see a show that has been put together with the values that this one has is something to really aspire to and to really look, look and to really look to. And then hopefully what will happen is that will kind of filter down into the work that we do as a city on a day-to-day -day basis with our suppliers and with our with our major events and with our own kind of bars, clubs, clubs and restaurants. So I just I think it's just a brilliant time to start reimagining what the future is going to be. So the challenge, not just for us, but for everybody in the creative industries, is to use this time to plan and embrace real seismic change. So when we can reassemble, those events don't materially damage the health of the people around them anymore, and no longer place the planet in deeper and deeper peril. At the moment, our focus is quite rightly on COVID. You know, it's absolutely come out of the blue and it's decimated the sector and actually our city's economy. So for us, COVID is very immediate, but it's not long term. And actually to create an event that is safe for people to come in a COVID environment, we still need to be thinking about what the long term implications of doing events that aren't carbon neutral, you know, that aren't looking after environment, that aren't creating a sustainable way of us doing events. I guess ultimately we hope that new and unorthodox partnerships like this between artists, cities, power and transport providers might proliferate and that we can use our creativity in a different way to make that change happen faster.